Japan looks set to get a new prime minister after a leadership contest in the ruling party. Is it a victory for elites over the grassroots? Will Fumio Kishida bring change in how Japan faces challenges at home and abroad? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Fumio Kishida was picked by veteran party members and criticized for being old school. Now the former foreign minister is leading Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party. He's set now to become prime minister. Kishida was seen as a safe choice for the LDP as it faces general elections in November. He's challenged with leading the party to victory after its popularity declined. But he's got to win public support too. He wasn't the most favoured contender among young party members, nor among the Japanese people. Kishida has pledged to counter China's growing influence and promised to narrow Japan's income inequality gap. Florence Louis reports. Fumio Kishida is the new chief of Japan's governing Liberal Democratic Party. He's also set to become prime minister, as his party and coalition partner control the Houses of Parliament. It's the second time the former foreign minister has run for the leadership, after competing against outgoing Premier Yoshihide Suga last year. In his acceptance speech, Kishida promised to lead the party to success in next month's general election. I want to firmly show a reborn Liberal Democratic Party to the Japanese citizens and urge them to support us. From today I will, with all my energy, get straight to work. Party members around the country and members of parliament, please work with me. A first round vote had failed to produce a majority winner and two female contenders dropped out of the race. In a runoff, Kishida faced Taro Kono, an outspoken minister in charge of Japan's COVID-19 vaccine rollout who'd been ahead in opinion polls. But widely regarded as a safe pair of hands, Kishida had the support of lawmakers and beat his rival by 257 votes to 170. Analysts say Kishida's rise to the premiership is unlikely to affect defence and international relations. He supports close ties with Western democracies to counter China's growing influence in the region. On the economy, Kishida has pledged to spend big on a stimulus package and emphasised the need to distribute more wealth to households. But first, he faces a difficult challenge, a general election that has to be held by November. What uh, I expect to see is something ambitious like a very large stimulus package dedicated to um, pandemic management and the health system in general. Although, of course, nothing is really going to be implemented. There's going to be no evidence of success in time for the election. So in a lar to a large extent, Kishida is going to be selling hope and asking the electorate to trust him rather than demonstrating any concrete results there. Kishida may be seen as a stable choice, but some analysts say his bland image may work against him in the upcoming polls. Florence Louis, Al Jazeera. Well, let's bring in our guest now. We have joining us from Tokyo, Donna Weeks, Professor of Political Science at Musashino University. In Shizuka, Saijiro Takeshita, Professor of Management at the University of Shizuka. And in Tokyo, Craig Mark, Professor of International Studies at Koryutsu Women's University. Welcome to you all. Let's start with Donna, if we could. So, Donna, Mr. Kishida lacks popular support. He appears to suffer from some of the same weak points which got the better of Yoshihide Suga. Why did the Liberal Democrats choose Kishida then? I guess because they weren't all that keen to have Kono, who does have, uh, I guess, a greater popularity with the younger members and uh, perhaps the broader public. And so they, uh, it seems in the last 24 hours we're coming to understand that they uh, made some swift uh, changes and, uh, and deals and uh, to ensure that uh, they got their man Kishida in the end. 
So then, Craig, listening to what Donna said there, is this just a classic case of the elites prevailing over the party rank and file, perhaps even over the will of the public? Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, uh, uh, before the uh, uh, leadership race was uh, concluded yesterday, there was a lot of speculation about uh, the factions allowing a free vote, uh, which uh, wouldn't usually happen. Uh, uh, in because as Donna said, a lot of the younger uh, diet members are worried that they could lose their seats in the uh, upcoming election uh, due to some happened sometime in November. Uh, but as we've seen, the uh, factions reasserted themselves, and uh, uh, the vote, of course, was very close uh, between uh, Kishida and Kono. Uh, Kono was actually expected to win the first round, but he just uh, got uh, pipped by uh, Kishida uh, by one vote. And uh, so uh, that was the sign that the uh, factions had reasserted themselves and had swung their weight behind Kishida. And that uh, couldn't compensate for the popularity that Kono had in the branches. He got about uh, nearly half of the branch vote in the first round, uh, but that wasn't enough to get Kono through uh, on the second round. All right, let's bring in Seijiro now. When we talk about this is a sign of the factions getting their way, who are we talking about? Are we really talking about a very narrow faction, the more conservative right-wing leaning elements of the LDP? No, not necessarily so. It's a lot more to do with the power play uh, between the factional levels. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, there is a tendency that uh, the MPs tend to go on the bandwagon of who the winner is likely to be because you will get a better allocation of better position in ministries at all. So there is that tendency to basically go for the winner. And uh, obviously, on a factional basis, uh, Mr. Kishida always had an upper hand. So. Uh, you saw this, um, uh, I would say, last-minute rush to support, you know, uh, Mr. Kishida for that reason, because many of the LDP members, uh, LDP, that's MPs, that is, uh, they would like to sustain the status quo, particularly with the election coming up in November, and their excessively conservative nature obviously uh, brought them to bring uh, Mr. Kishida as a prime minister. All right, uh, let's take it back to Donna a moment ago. We were talking about how this is a sign of the factional elites prevailing over the, the public and over the grassroots of even the LDP. Do you think the Liberal Democrats are, uh, are going to pay a price for that when it comes to general elections being held uh, in November, as we all expect? This time around, uh, probably not. And, you know, the, the opposition parties haven't really been able to make much ground uh, during, you know, even this last year or so of, of the coronavirus and COVID and, and how uh, the LDP has been uh, dealing with that and, and stumbling with the vaccination rollout and so on. So I think if ever there had been a time that the opposition parties could have... Uh, you know, made some advances, uh, now would have been it. The other thing, too, that I think we will have to take into account is today is the last day of the state of emergency. This, the state of emergency is, is lifted in just a, a couple of hours now, which means that uh, people can start to go out again, uh, bars and entertainment and restaurants and so on, can actually start to serve alcohol again, which I'm anticipating will give people a little bit of a lift and it may work in Kishida's, this is just speculation, it may work in Kishida's favour that when people come to vote, they'll, they'll have this sense perhaps that things are starting to lift and given that uh, the elections are largely won and lost on uh, economic issues, I think uh, potentially there'll be a lift in the in that sense of the economic environment and uh, and people might say, well, let's go with the LDP again. All right. Say, so, Jiro, taking that scenario, even if the, re the releasing or the relaxing, shall we say, of some of the coronavirus restrictions does give him a bit of a lift, as Donna put it there, will it give him, even if he wins elections, even if the LDP wins elections, will it be enough to give him a strong mandate to carry, any, carry out any serious reforms? 
Well, the question is, does he really want to conduct a reform? And is that what he's expected? Of course, you know, to the public, he will say that, you know, LDP needs a reform, and obviously they do. But it's quite clear that he's not going to make radical changes as Mr. Kono would have done. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the MPs have voted for him. Uh, he will make, you know, some modifications. Well, hang on, though. The... So when he talks about making changes, addressing the wealth gap, yeah. uh, you don't think any of that is serious? Of course it's serious. Uh, in Japan, the income inequality gap is, is certainly a time bomb, in my opinion, because the Japanese are probably the ones who have realized the idealisms of socialism. In other words, we don't have a lot of you know, inequality gap in compared to other OECD nations. But that said, that has widened quite uh, you know, dramatically, especially after COVID-19. So obviously, this is one thing that he has to tackle. Uh, but, you know, this is the exactly same thing has been said by Mr. You know, Kono as well. Uh, we know that that's the homework that all you know politicians has to do. So it's really nothing new in, in, in that context. The radical changes that I'm talking about is the constructive destruction within the LDP. Now, this is, you know, uh, something that, you know, Mr. Kono was about to do, but certainly not Mr. Kishida, who will be trying to basically balance things out. He's known as a very good balancer. So I doubt that there will be a drastic, you know, uh, innovative change within the LDP. But of course, for the economic policy side, of course, there will be, you know, um, he's already announced a 10 trillion yen package already. So there will be a lot of announcements that we've made. And it makes it easier because the Japanese public's anger has simmered down. As you know, Donna was saying, we've got the lift off of this you know, emergency measures and also the vaccine saturation level has almost reached the same level as the United States and the United Kingdom. So things are definitely getting a lot better as far as environment is concerned. All right, Craig, listening there to what Seijira had to say, you've got to wonder whether the talk of a new capitalism by the new leader, by the incoming, if we can call him the incoming prime minister, the vote's expected to pass very easily on Monday in Parliament. Um, how radically new a vision do you expect then, listening to what Saijira had to say about he's basically a man of a political balancing act? That's why the elites went for him. Yeah, well, have to see what the actual concrete policy proposals are going to be. It is significant, though, that he did clearly say that uh, uh, he is going to depart from Abenomics. Uh, by saying that something had to be done to address the income gap because uh, under Shinzo Abe's uh, policies and continuing on with one year of suga, uh, the stock market did increase and the big corporations uh, enjoyed healthy profits and sitting on huge cash reserves, but the income and assets of ordinary people and households went down, wages have been really flat. So we will have to see whether Kishida's uh, policies uh, do uh, walk the walk rather than talk the talk. Um, it's interesting, though, uh, it's something that's uh, just been announced uh, today, this evening, uh, about uh, who uh, Kishida's uh, uh, secretary general for the Liberal Democratic Party is going to be. And that's uh, a bloke called Akira Amari. Um, he's uh, a heavyweight in the LDP. He's of the Aso faction of the uh, now outgoing Deputy Prime Minister Taro Aso, but uh, he was one of the architects of Abenomics. He was the Economic uh, Revitalization Minister uh, under Shinzo Abe until he was forced to step down in 2016 due to a bribery scandal. So uh, it's very uh, significant that uh, uh, Fumio Kishida has chosen him for his uh, Secretary General. And uh, so uh, that's an indication of how much the LDP establishment has reasserted itself. So uh, uh, there's quite an indication that uh, Shinzo Abe has been very happy with the outcome of uh, uh, yesterday's leadership election, even though he was outwardly backing uh, Sane Takeichi, one of the uh, two female candidates. And uh, she's actually going to be the LDP policy chief, which uh, Kishida was. Uh, up until recent, uh, after he was uh, foreign minister. So we've had some interesting uh, juggling of the party positions 
already. And uh, Tano Asso, the Deputy Prime Minister, yeah, he's now going to be Vice President, so he's been shuffled off sideways. Well, that segues nicely to the next point I was going to ask Donna, which is, is Kashida really just a continuation, an extension of Shinzo Abe's policies? Do you agree with those who say, if anything, this election, uh, this contest shows the continuing power or at least influence of Shinzo Abe in the LDP? Yes, look, I, I think there was never going to be any doubt of as to how much influence Abe was going to continue to hold, particularly last year when he didn't resign from Parliament. To me, that was a sure sign that he was planning to stick around uh, for as long as he could. And so I'm not surprised too much in, in that regard. Um, I guess, you know, in the 24 hours or so since yesterday, you know, they say 24 hours is a long time in politics, and it's certainly yesterday we might have been... I've said uh, in, in other places, a little bit optimistic that perhaps some of what Kishida deep down wants to do might come through. But I think the last 24 hours and indeed the the positions that uh, Craig has just mentioned, you know, we're waiting for those the announcement of those positions to see how much um, uh, Kishida was going to be constrained by the factional deals and clearly he's going to be very constrained and I think next week too when we see the cabinet, uh, the ministry selections, we'll get a, a greater indication of just how much uh, I think, yes, he's, he's probably going to uh, to have to stick to the Abe line for a little bit longer. Sticking to the Abe line, will that rescue Japan from the stagnation, from the challenges which Japan didn't overcome even under the rule of Shinzo Abe. What do you think, Seijiro? No, unfortunately, it will not. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, well, you know, Abenomics, the first arrow was fine. Um, the weekend has basically surged the income of the Japanese exporters, which was expected to basically increase the income of the Japanese people. That didn't happen. So obviously, uh, Mr. Kishida and Mr. Kono both were basically uh, indirectly uh, making sure that, you know, they would certainly push for the increase of wages to take place um, so that, you know, private spending will basically flourish. But in Japan, um, one of the characteristics of a Japanese um, consumer spending is that you have to have a secure conditions of the corporations still lifelong employment and seniority system, although it is basically crumbling, it still is very intact, particularly amongst the larger companies, meaning that the stable condition of these companies are a must for the Japanese to start spending. So obviously it will be very difficult, you know, even if you make these policies and even if he's able to implement them, because Mr. Kishida do have a very good tie with the bureaucrats. And this is a very important thing about Japan. Mm -hmm. You have to have a very good tie with the bureaucrats in order to actually implement, you know, whatever the policies uh, that they may come up with. So um, so he will be able to have a pretty good pipeline there. But, you know, will his new policies will have an effect to basically turn Japan around? That still remains to be a, a very big question indeed. And I'm using a very politically correct word for that. Well, I'm glad you've, you've touched upon exports and trading. This maybe gives us an opportunity to pivot towards foreign policy. What do you think, Craig? Do we expect Kishida to take a hawkish policy towards China, one of its uh, biggest trading partners? Well, he's going to have to uh, strike a balance. Uh, in the lead up to the, uh, in the leadership election, it's very interesting. He did make some more hawkish uh, gestures. Uh, he said he's going to appoint a special prime ministerial advisor to look at uh, the human rights situation in China, uh, particularly towards treatment of the Uyghurs and also for Hong Kong. Uh, he's committed to uh, increasing uh, spending on the, on the self-defence forces, including expanding their potential uh, overseas strike pack capacity, including uh, cruise missiles and hypersonic missiles. Uh, but he has said, on the other hand, the, how important it is to have stable relations uh, with China. And uh, since it is uh, Japan's largest, largest trading partner, so uh, we'll have to see how he can handle that balance. Um, he did it fairly well when he was uh, foreign minister. He was able to repair relations and keep them fairly steady. But uh, with the rising geopolitical tensions between China and the United States, 
uh, in the quad, in the uh, or Orcus Alliance now. Um, that's going to be a big, very, very big ask as well. I'm glad you touched upon the quad and the Orcus Alliance. Donna, given what he said on the campaign trail, Kashida is expected to continue the sort of alliance Japan has traditionally had with the US. But do you think Japan feels a little bit left out of this AUKUS alliance? Look, I think, um, well, particularly as an Australian here in Tokyo, when uh, the news of the AUKUS alliance broke, it was uh, somewhat surprising. And I guess uh, to me, as someone who's done a lot of work in this area for the last 30 years, um, a kind of a, a, you know, going back to a kind of an Anglosphere uh, kind of approach to uh, defence in, in the region. And we've had a lot of confidence building uh, over the last uh, several years through the various um, multilateral um, architectures and so on. And, you know, the Quad, um, you know, at, at another time we can talk about the pros and cons of the Quad, but but the Quad was at least starting to emerge as something that, that key uh, powers in the region, key countries in the region could could make something of. And, and I think this AUKUS uh, structure that's coming over the top, I, I think certainly in the short term is going to cost a little bit in terms of trust. I think Japan is now sort of thinking, well, where exactly do we sit? Uh, here's another layer that we, that we have to contemplate. And I think just as Japan was anticipating or expecting, and uh, I think uh, some in the LDP have talked about joining the five eyes uh, and so on with, with some of the other countries here, I think it's maybe a momentary setback at least. But, but Kishida... Uh, as, as foreign minister uh, and his faction uh, is somewhat more of the dovish side. He's from, well, his, his uh, area is Hiroshima and he has made some uh, strong statements as far as uh, that heritage of his goes. And so I see that Kishida will have to be making some uh, pragmatic choices between what he might want uh, himself as uh, in terms of security and where he will have to go as, as Prime Minister at I, this stage. That's a really interesting point. Let me take it to say, Jiro, the pragmatism may be coming through. Does that explain why, for example, we've heard or we've seen signals from, from China, the Chinese state broadcaster at the very least, describing Kishida's victory as the best option for Beijing, despite you know the sort of noises which Kashida made about China on the campaign trail. Well, actually, the most hawkish person amongst the four candidates was Takaichi San, but uh, actually, um, she has uh, been basically spun off on the first round, uh, and um, Mr. Kashida had been the longest, uh, you know, serving uh, foreign minister. So obviously he does have a good international relations. So obviously, you know, uh, from that aspect, it might be seen as very positive for Japan-China relations. But that said, as the formation quad makes it very clear of uh, where Japan has to stand, and uh, obviously Mr. Kishida has to clarify that to the international arena. And that is that from both the trade perspective and the border perspective, uh, you know, Japan will be under the umbrella of the United States, especially in means of security. And uh, the fight over hegemony between the United States and China that's occurring in all areas, including trade, telecommunication and finance. Which side is Japan going to be? It's very clear which side Japan is going to be in spite of the very large trade that we have with China. So that has to be clarified, particularly with the redemption or I should say modification of supply chains that Japan has to tackle immediately with this excessive reliance to China in various areas. That has to be also changed as well. So that's another very big homework, which is not much talked about. But, well, it's a homework for most of the OECD nations, but particularly for Japan. All right, we'll have to leave it there. It's been fascinating. Let's thank our guests for this discussion. Donna Weeks, Seijiro Takashita and Craig Mark. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here, for now, it's goodbye. <laughs>